It's always been Finestre's goal to support the widest variety of fax devices in the industry. By comparison, some other fax server packages only support the Brook Trout TR1034 and SR140. We've always made an effort to give our customers as many options as possible. Now, we were forced to retire several of our device connectors as part of the move to a 64-bit platform, simply because there are no drivers available for those devices to allow them to function in the latest 64-bit operating systems. And although this looks like a short list, both the BFAX TR Extreme device and the CAPI device connectors support dozens of models of fax cards and line types. This list also includes four different fax over IP solutions. A FaxNation fax device connector is the interface between the FaxNation kernel and the fax hardware or application. We can recommend a solution for any telephony interface, including analog, BRI, PRI, T1, E1, ISDN, DID, and fax over IP. We support Brook Trout TR Extreme devices and the software-based SR140. We have our own fax over IP connector. We support CAPI-based fax devices from ICON and Dialogic, AVM, and XCAPI. And we include connectors for generic fax modems and the ASCOM digital fax router, albeit for evaluations only. There are two definitions of the word service that are important to understand when working with vaccination. We're all familiar with the Windows services, which are background processes controlled by the operating system. In vaccination, the BFAX TR Extreme device connector runs as a Windows service. The other use of the word service refers to how one or more lines or channels are configured on a fax device. Here we have a four channel analog card, which we can configure as a single service or divide into as many as four separate services. A digital fax card may only have a single cable running into it, but a full E1 card can support 30 simultaneous channels. Each fax device is identified by at least one service, but we can divide those 30 channels into as many services as we need to support certain deployment goals. For example, here we've divided a 30-channel fax card into three vaccination services. Channels 1 through 10 are configured for both inbound and outbound calls. Channels 11 through 20 are dedicated for inbound calls only. And channels 21 through 30 are dedicated for outbound calls only. There are several reasons why you might want to do this. For example, if inbound faxes are critical to your business workflows, you may want to ensure that there are dedicated inbound channels available regardless of the amount of outbound faxing you're currently doing. You don't want your customers getting busy signals when they try to fax in their purchase orders just because you happen to be faxing out an updated price list to your entire customer database at the same time. Now it's important that you don't confuse fax card channels or lines with fax numbers. Channels or lines refers to how many simultaneous fax transmissions, both inbound and outbound, the card can handle. Because the routing digits are passed at the beginning of each inbound call, there is no relationship at all between channels and fax numbers. The E1 card could support a single, high-volume, toll-free fax number or hundreds of unique fax numbers for individual employees or departments. The number of channels that you need is based on your total peak volume and not the quantity of fax numbers that you own. For more than a decade, the king of the hardware intelligent fax card market has been Brook Trout. The current TR1034 series is available in both PCI Express and Universal PCI form factors, supporting every existing telephony interface, both analog and digital. The story behind the intelligent fax card market is an interesting one, and we're going to take a couple of minutes to talk about all of the major players and just how we arrived at the current state of affairs. The story begins way back in 1985. A company called GammaLink introduced their Gamma fax cards. These were the first fax cards available for personal computers. And what we're looking at here is an old, full-length, 16-bit ISA card. 
1994, Gamalink was purchased by Dialogic, and they continued to sell fax cards under the Gamafax name. In 1999, Dialogic was purchased by Intel. Now, of course, Intel is a gigantic company, and no one knows what they were intending to do with the Gamafax technology. But no new products were developed while they owned it, and Gamafax support just disappeared. Intel basically just let it die, and fax software developers like us were forced to recommend other products to our customers. In 2006, Icon purchased Intel's media and signaling division, which included the Dialogic trademark and its technologies. Now, Icon and Dialogic had always been fierce competitors. Dialogic had GammaFax, and Icon had fax cards based on the CAPI standard, what we refer to as Diva cards, because that was the name of their CAPI device layer. Icon decided that the Dialogic name was bigger and more prestigious, so when they purchased the rights from Intel, they changed their name to Dialogic. The big competitor for all of these companies was Brook Trout, based in Boston. In fact, Brook Trout and Dialogic had a major legal battle regarding DID fax cards, and Finestre was subpoenaed to testify on behalf of Brook Trout during the court proceedings. Brook Trout successfully defended their patents and became the only company allowed to manufacture fax cards with a DID interface. In 2005, Brook Trout was purchased by a company called Cantata Technology. Cantata was sort of an umbrella company that would buy up different technologies, mix and match them, and then sell them on to the highest bidder. In 2007, that highest bidder was Dialogic. So basically all of these companies have merged over time into a single entity. Dialogic has really only focused on their Brook Trout products, the TR1034 and the SR140. They are both still actively developed, and each new version of Vaccination always includes the latest Brook Trout SDK. Vaccination 2016 ships with SDK version 6.7.3, which provides the latest 64-bit drivers for the Brook Trout fax cards, and the most recent version of the SR140 software fax over IP solution. The configuration for the Faxination BFAX TR Extreme device is launched from the Fenestre Server Administrator under Device Connectors. Note the name TR Extreme was a marketing term that Brook Trout used when it first introduced the TR1034 series of cards in the early 2000s. The TR1034 eventually replaced the older TR114 cards, which are now obsolete. The name TR Extreme hasn't been used to sell TR1034 cards in over a decade, but Vaccination has retained the name for our connector for legacy reasons. The General tab and Connectivity tab are the same for all fax device connectors. The connector name is the name that is used in the contract between the kernel and this device connector. This is a security feature that ensures that only authorized connectors can talk to authorized kernels, and vice versa. The contracts are created automatically during the initial install and in add-remove operations. Normally, they do not need to be modified manually. Machine is the domain name of the server that is running this connector. This is also referenced in the contract between the kernel and the device connector. If domain name resolution is a problem, this can also be an IP address, but the kernel side of the contract must also reference the machine in the same way. The wake-up port is the UDP port where this connector will listen for new connections from the vaccination kernel. This port is unique for all host and device connectors. This is a complete list of the unique UDP wake-up ports used by vaccination 2016 device connectors. You can find this list in the Vaccination 2016 Administrator's Guide. You may change these if you have specific needs, such as firewall traversal, but you must change the port on both sides of the contract, both the kernel and the connector. Another security feature is that you can set the IP range or whitelist of kernels that are allowed to communicate with this connector. Connections originating from outside this range will be rejected with no response. You can also create blacklists of IP ranges to reject. It's rare for vaccination to be installed in a hostile environment that would require this level of security, but it's there if you need it. 
On the connectivity tab, the left pane identifies the kernel server that this device connector will communicate with. The configurator suggests that multiple kernels can be defined here, but really only one is allowed. I think this menu layout is from before Faxination began using HTTP instead of RPC to communicate with the remote components, and it just never got changed. The right pane allows you to configure services for this device connector. As we saw earlier, a single fax card can be divided up into multiple services, each with a different configuration and messaging direction. By default, a single in-out service will be created using all of the available channels of the fax device. If you highlight a service and click Configure, you can modify the configuration of that device. On the Device tab, we can see that the channel count and the Brookshot SDK version have been detected automatically. If these fields are empty, it means that there is something wrong with the Brookshot driver or the Boston service. Just run Add Remove to reinstall the BFAX TR Extreme device connector and the Brookshot drivers, and that should resolve it. If you're using Exchange Unified Messaging, your end users may be set up with a single phone number for both voice and fax. When Exchange detects fax tones, it passes the call to faxination with the end user's mailbox as the destination instead of a routing code. The only downside to this is that it limits your inbound routing options to a single mailbox destination, whereas with routing codes, it can normally be assigned to multiple mailboxes and applications, such as SharePoint. The only options here are automatic and disabled. You can launch the Brook Trout Configurator tool from here. The tool is part of the Brook Trout SDK. Typically, you just use the wizard mode if you want to adjust the line configuration, set up hardware fax over IP, or set up the software-based fax over IP SR140 when there's no fax card present. The advanced mode is used when multiple cards are installed in the system and they need to be configured independently. This is a look at the Brook Trout configuration tool. For digital telephony, T1, E1, ISDN, most of the time you don't need to make any changes here, as long as the telephony provider or administrator has configured the line properly for a fax server. The digital fax cards have a secondary Ethernet port, which can be used for hardware-based fax over IP. The mode is exclusive, which means you cannot mix T1, E1, ISDN and fax over IP. It's either one or the other. The channel count is also the same depending on the card, so an 8-channel E1 card is also an 8-channel fax over IP card, just not at the same time. If you don't have a TR1034 fax card, this is also the same interface to license the SR140. The SR140 is built into the Brook Trout SDK, so it gets installed automatically when you install the Faxination BFAX TR Extreme device connector. However, it does not have an automatic evaluation mode. You can request an evaluation key from your Finestre sales contact or Finestre partner. This is also where you would apply your license when you purchase the SR140. Remember that we've left Faxination and are now looking at the Brook Trout software. If you have a problem with the Brook Trout configuration tool, Finestre support will help you as much as they can. If there's something they can't resolve, they'll open a ticket with Dialogic on your behalf. Back on the Connectivity tab, we're going to take a look at the configuration of our default in-out service. First is the name of the service. Keep it short and descriptive. Avoid spaces and special characters. The lines or number of lines for this service. This can be a range of channels like 1 through 16, or one or more explicit channels separated by commas. We once had a support call where one specific channel of an 8-channel ISDN card was failing, uh, for instance, channel 5. You could avoid that by configuring the service to use channels 1 through 4, and then channels 6, 7, and 8. The CSID to transmit for all outgoing faxes by default. This is the small text that you see at the top of each page of a transmitted fax. The service default will be used unless the sender has a CSID assigned to them or unless they specify a CSID to use when they have CSID override permissions. Baud rate is the maximum baud rate allowed for this service. 
The actual baud rate will be negotiated at transmission time, but will not exceed this value. This might be useful in areas that have poor quality phone service and frequently dropped fax calls. If you find that 33.6 is being successfully negotiated, but the calls often fail, you can try forcing a lower maximum speed. And here we can set the message direction of this service. Note that this direction must be in agreement with the configuration of the telephony system or line provider. Incoming calls to an outbound only service will fail. On the inbound tab, first we can set the path to use for temporary storage as inbound faxes are being processed. This is usually a local explicit path, but you can also use a UNC format if you want to use a network share. Verify routing before accept. Basically, the first thing we get from an inbound fax call are the routing digits, typically the last four digits of the number that was dialed to send the fax. When this option is enabled, we'll do a quick LDAP database query to see if those routing digits can be matched to an inbound destination. If no match is found, we immediately reject the call. The service routing ID is a separate routing identifier. This is associated with all incoming faxes that are processed through this service. It's an arbitrary value and just defaults to 9999. Typically, a service route will be assigned to a vaccination administrator as a catch-all for incoming faxes that can't be matched to any other inbound destination. Now imagine a situation where you have a salesperson named Craig and Craig has a fax number associated with his account. Craig leaves the company, and his account is deleted from Active Directory or put in an organizational unit within Active Directory where Faxination is not looking for users. The next time a fax comes in, Faxination can't find the route to Craig, so it falls back to the service route and the fax is delivered to the Faxination Administrator. The Administrator sees the fax, realizes that uh, the fax was intended for Craig, Craig's replacement is Steve, so the administrator now knows that he needs to associate that fax routing code with Steve so that the administrator uh, won't be receiving those faxes through the service route. Under DTMF is where you enable inbound routing digits. The term DTMF, or dual tone multi-frequency, is technically for analog cards, but it's used here to mean any form of routing digits that are passed to vaccination by the telephony system or line provider. You can set the expected number of digits, which should match the configuration of the telephony system, and the time in milliseconds to wait for those digits. On the Outbound tab, the header field allows you to construct the outgoing page headers from the CSID, explicit text, and variables such as the page number, total pages, date time, and so forth. You can set the language to use for the day and time when the fax header is constructed. Note that the T.30 fax standard is limited to ASCII for the fax header, so some Unicode and double byte characters may not convert perfectly. It depends on the receiving device. The dial prefix can be defined for all outgoing calls if your PBX requires it to get an outbound line. Typically this is an 8 or a 9. Sometimes there needs to be a slight delay between the digit and the actual outgoing fax number. So commas can be used to indicate half second pause each. In this case we dial a 9 to get an outside line, wait one second, that's two commas, and then send the outgoing digits. Wait for dial tone. Do we need to wait for the PBX to give us a dial tone, or do we just send the outgoing digits blindly? This depends on the PBX. Timeout after X number of seconds. This is how long to wait for the call to be established. A value of zero here means no limit. Wait forever. Calling party number is like caller ID for faxes. When supported by your telephony system, all outgoing fax calls through this service will identify themselves as originating from this number. The fax transmit mode can help resolve some issues with interoperability. The options are auto and manual. The only difference between the two are some timing tweaks. Auto will be used in most cases. Moving on to CAPI, 
Typically, the vaccination CAPI device talks to a CAPI layer provided by the card manufacturer. The actual line configuration is done within the software that comes with the card or downloaded from the manufacturer's website. Vaccination has no knowledge of the type of telephony system that the CAPI layer is connecting to. CAPI is analogous to DirectX, so bear with me here. If you were a PC gamer back in the 80s and 90s, it was always important to look at the hardware requirements on the back of the game box. You had to know the hardware in your computer back home, and you had to make sure that the game was compatible with your system. The game developers had to include support for your specific hardware, or the game wouldn't work properly or wouldn't work at all. Then Microsoft developed DirectX as a hardware abstraction layer. Game developers only needed to include support for DirectX in their video games. They didn't need to know anything specific about your computer. The game could talk to DirectX, and DirectX could talk to your hardware. As long as there was a Windows driver for your hardware, it was compatible with your video game. CAPI works in the same way. Vaccination's CAPI device connector talks to the CAPI layer, which then talks to the fax card. The CAPI layer is provided by the card manufacturer, and that includes the configuration interface. Vaccination has no knowledge of the fax hardware or the line type. It talks to all CAPI devices in the same way. An interesting application of the CAPI standard is XCAPI from TE Systems. XCAPI is both a CAPI layer and a software-based fax over IP application. Our CAPI layer talks to XCAPI, and XCAPI talks directly to the telephony system or SIP provider. No hardware or drivers are involved. Again, vaccination has no knowledge of what's going on beyond the CAPI layer. All the telephony configuration is done within XCAPI itself. As of release 3.5.44, the XCAPI controller wizard comes with configuration profiles for 36 SIP trunk providers and 64 PBX systems. Just select your telephony environment from the menus and you're ready to go. TE Systems is a German company and their website is in both German and English. We've had many successful integrations with them, so we can definitely recommend them as a fax over IP alternative, and they may be the best option for some SIP trunk implementations. Most of these fields are the same as what we saw on the Brook Trout card. The board ID is used to identify which board this service will support when multiple CAPI fax cards are installed. This is referred to as the controller number inside the latest Diva server software. The line count is the number of channels available on the card. Note that CAPI does not allow the card to be divided up the way that we do with Brook Trout cards, so if you have a 16 channel card, you put 16 in this field. The message direction for this service. Remember that this has to match your telephony system. On the inbound tab, first we can set the path to use for temporary storage as inbound faxes are being processed. This is usually a local, explicit path, but you can also use UNC format if you want to use a network share. Called party number filtering refers to the number that was dialed to send the incoming fax. You can configure explicit numbers or ranges of numbers. When this is enabled, inbound calls to numbers that are not configured here will be rejected, even though they are legitimate fax numbers that you own. You can configure an inbound blacklist based on the caller ID of the sending device. This is useful if you've identified the fax number of certain spammers. Inbound routing digits are always expected with CAPI. Here you set the number of routing digits to expect from the telephony system. This is the maximum amount of time to wait between any two routing digits. If this times out before the required digits have been received, the CAPI connector will request more digits. Reject calls if the routing digits cannot be matched to the destination. Enable inbound routing based on digits coming from the telephony system and specify the rightmost number of digits to use for routing. For instance, you might be receiving 10 digits from a PBX, but you only want to route on the last four.
service routing ID for this device. Remember that this is most often used for unroutable faxes and typically goes to an administrator. The 9999 number is the default but can be anything. On the outbound tab, the header field allows you to construct the outgoing page headers from the CSID, explicit text, and variables such as the page number, total pages, date, time, and so forth. Select the language to use for the day and the month in the fax header. The dial prefix, timeout, and calling party number are the same as they are for Brookshout cards. You always want to get the latest version of the Dialogic Diva software from the Dialogic website. Remember that unlike with Brookshout cards, all of the line configuration for CAPI cards is done within the CAPI software and not the vaccination CAPI connector. Regarding CAPI devices, use only CAPI solutions tested by Finestre. Install the fax board in its software and test independently of vaccination. Always download and install the latest software for the board. The board ID within the vaccination software is equal to the controller number within the Diva software. The cards are plug and play and should be automatically configured by the operating system. Always check the Fenestry support site for patches if you're having problems. For the vaccination fax over IP device, inbound via address is the IP address to use when listening for incoming connections. This is needed when you have multiple network cards or have multiple IP bindings to the same card. By default, this field is empty and the standard IP address of the server is used automatically. Media address is the IP address to use for the actual T.38 data as defined in the initial SIP signaling. When this field is empty, the standard IP address of the server is used. Port where vaccination will listen to new connections. The vaccination FOIP device is SIP only, and the default SIP port is 5060, so this is used in most cases. 5060 is just the SIP setup port. Once we switch to T.38 mode, the base port number will be used to send and receive the data. This must be an even number. When the base port is not available, for instance if it's busy with another incoming fax call, the port number is incremented by this amount until an available port is found. This must also be an even number. On the Registrar tab, we can select whether or not we want to use a Registrar server. A SIP Registrar keeps track of all the SIP devices in the environment, their capabilities, and status. Most environments don't use them, but if you have a lot of SIP technologies in your organization, like voice and video conferencing, you may have one. If Use Registrar Server is enabled, you define the Registrar Server here by its fully qualified domain name or IP address. Also, if your Registrar Server uses a non-standard SIP port, you can specify that here. The default is 5060 for SIP. Some Registrars require that you publish your voice and fax numbers before inbound connections can be made. You can do this through explicit numbers or ranges of numbers. On the Proxy tab, you may enable the use of a SIP proxy. Proxies are required for SIP authentication in some environments. When enabled, you can specify an address and a port number for proxy communication. On the Advanced tab, you can configure some SIP T.38 interoperability options. First, we set the operating mode. The options are 1. Invite T.38, wait reinvite. 2. Invite audio plus T.38, send reinvite with no audio plus T.38. 3. Invite audio, wait reinvite. 4. Invite audio, send reinvite, no audio plus T.38. And 5. Invite audio, send reinvite T.38. The default is mode 5. We initially send an audio invite to establish the connection, then change the mode to T.38. This mode works well in most environments. Reinvite delay 
When the operating mode includes a reinvite, this is how long we wait before sending it. The default is one second. You can set the voice codec priority. A law is common in Europe. U law is common in North America and Japan. The rest of the world uses a mix of the two. If we're having interoperability issues in a particular environment, we typically start off with Wireshark logs and a trace log of the device connector. If we need even more information, we can enable a low-level trace. There is a standard mode and an extensive mode. These should be enabled temporarily and only for troubleshooting as they can negatively impact server performance. On our connectivity tab, we have our services pane on the right as usual. On the general tab, first we give this service a name. Select how many concurrent or simultaneous inbound and outbound fax calls this service will support. This is based on vaccination licensing. Set the default CSID to transmit. Set the maximum transmission speed allowed by this service. Set the T.38 version. 33 SIX speeds are only available in T.38 version 3 and ECM must be enabled. This still requires that the remote end support these features, so fallback to lower speeds is common regardless of these settings. Set the direction of messages for this service. As always, this configuration must be matched by the telephony system. On the inbound tab, first we set the IP address or name of the system or gateway that is allowed to establish a connection to this service. An asterisk or a star means to accept all connections. You can configure an explicit inbound blacklist. Connections from servers or gateways on this list will be rejected. Local or UNC path for temporary storage of inbound faxes. The minimum number of routing digits required from the telephony system or gateway. Verify that the fax can be routed before accepting the connection. Enable or disable inbound routing based on digits coming from the telephony system or gateway. The rightmost digits of the received routing digits to use. The service routing ID to use when the received routing information does not match a recipient in the environment. Error correction mode frame size. This can be 64 or 256 bytes. 256 is the default. And you can select the supported page encoding methods. All of the methods are enabled by default. The T.6 method, which is 2D modified modified read, requires ECM to be enabled. On the outbound tab, we can configure one or more gateways to use for outbound connections. The multiple gateways are for redundancy and will be tried in order from the top to the bottom of the list. You can set the interval between checks for new jobs coming from the vaccination kernel. The default is 20 seconds. Here is where you construct the header to use for all outbound faxes. It's made up of literals and variables. You can select the time zone to use in the date time variables in the header. The default is the local machine time zone. And you can select the language to use when the header includes day and month variables. The default is English. You can set the dial prefix required by your telephony system to access an outbound line. When required, this is often an 8 or a 9. Some systems require a slight delay between the dialing prefix and the outgoing fax number. A comma represents a half second delay. You can set the caller ID to use for all fax calls originating from this service. This is ignored when it's not supported by your telephony system. Set the error correction mode frame size. This can be 64 or 256 bytes and 256 is the default. You can select the supported page encoding methods. All of the methods are enabled by default. The T.6 method, 2D modified modified read, requires ECM to be enabled. On the advanced tab, 
we can enable SIP authentication and supply any credentials required for SIP communication. Maximum buffer size and maximum datagram size. These are the capabilities of the vaccination FOIP device that we pass to the fax gateway during the SIP invite. You can select the transport type, either UDP or TCP. This must be set to UDP mode or prefer UDP mode. TCP is not supported in the vaccination FOIP device at this time. The differentiated services setting has to do with the quality of service on the network and packet priority. Whether or not this is honored depends on the operating system and your network. Ultimately, it's the servers, routers, and switches on the network that must be configured to prioritize voice over IP and fax over IP packets. You can specify the maximum buffer size and maximum datagram size of the remote gateway when the gateway doesn't provide them. You also have the option to enforce these settings whether or not the remote gateway provides them. And finally, on the Timings tab, we can tweak some send and receive timings and timeouts. Like the frame buffer and datagram sizes, these settings are all about interoperability. You're expected to be working with Fenestre support if you're having the kind of issues that these tweaks would resolve. Our defaults are based around what we know works with Cisco gateways. The vaccination FOIP device connector is certified by Cisco, and they also adhere to the T.38 specifications better than most. And finally, the ASCOM digital fax router and the fax modem connector are provided for use during evaluations, but are not supported for production use.